Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I apologize in advance if I cough. I don't think I'm going to die on you, um, but I've been battling a cold for a couple of weeks now. Um, so I was listening to a, a podcast the other day. Do we have any fans of podcasts here? I can't, I can't see. You've got to make it known. Does anyone not know what podcasts are? Am I, like, alienating all of you already? Excellent. Um, no, I love podcasts. Um, download something interesting. Redeem some, some time that you normally wouldn't learn something. You know, doing the dishes, driving to work, whatever it is. Um, and so I listen to a lot of them, and one of my favorites explains things. Like, that's all they do, is they take, they take so, uh, topics and they explain stuff. They've talked about Legos. And they'll talk about it for 45 minutes, the history and all that stuff. They've talked about The Simpsons. They've talked about Ebola. They've talked about bullfighting. They've talked about everything that you can imagine. Um, and the other day, I was listening to an episode, um, and it was all about um, anarchy. And I thought, I'm preaching on 4th of July Sunday. This could get interesting. Um, so I was, I was listening to this podcast, um, and basically these two hosts, basically, you know, again, they just kind of talk through the history of these movements and things that have happened in history, and, and they talk through these things, and they start talking about this, this movement of anarchy, and what they wanted to make clear up at the very beginning is anarchy is not, like, it's not all ninth grade angry skateboarders, like, scribbling on their high school notebooks, okay? Like, anarchy, that's not what anarchy is. All anarchy is, is it comes from this word from Greek. This is the only Greek I'm going to use. It's not from the Bible. Um, you can relax. But anarchy says, it, uh, it's, it's a Greek word that means, it's anarchai, which just means without a king, without a ruler. And so there have been violent strands of this to try to overthrow governments and try to, try to, to disrupt until, until the government has no more power. But in its essence, what these two hosts were trying to convey is that, that anarchy is a desire to live in a world where there's no king needed. A, a world where, where people take care of one another. A world where we don't fight over how much we have or don't have because nothing belongs to one person. Or, you know, like, it's, it's just, we all share. I'm starting to, I, as they're talking about this, I'm starting to hear some parallels to, to a book that I read once. But as they started talking about it, the problem with anarchy is they talk about all these movements that come over and over and over and over. Um, they even said, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever done something for, for someone in your society, and, and we're at a church now, so I could say, if you've ever started a homeless ministry, or started a food pantry, without the approval and the funding of the government, without the stamp of the government's approval, you're acting on an anarchistic impulse. You're trying to do things without needing the government to rule over you. And they kept going, and I was like, whoa. And they started describing these movements that have happened throughout history. And as they went with one after the other after the other, they described how it started and how it failed. And every time they'd start talking about it, and I'd say, that sounds great, except for when people get involved. Like, that sounds like a great idea, but then there's gonna be people there, and the people are gonna ruin it, because that's what we do. The problem with anarchy that I realized is this whole, it sounds great until. It sounds great until someone wants more power and doesn't want to be equal. It sounds great until Someone gets offended and needs to defend themselves. It sounds great until it doesn't work. And so there's a whole, there's a whole genre. There's, have you ever noticed there's no genre of literature called utopian literature? It doesn't exist. Because every time someone starts thinking of a utopia, they realize immediately that it's going to go wrong, and so we have a genre called dystopian literature. And dystopian literature is based on, on all the ways that utopias go wrong. 
And at the very basis, this anarchy impulse is an impulse towards utopia. And take a little field trip back to ninth grade English class, right? And George Orwell wrote a book about communism called Animal Farm. And the animals rise up and they kick the farmer off of his land and they say, we are going to run this differently. And they write seven commandments. And the seventh commandment is, all animals are equal. But the pigs are smart. And they're at the center of all the planning. And slowly over the course of the book, they, they consolidate more power. And eventually they move into the farmhouse. And eventually they start drinking the farmer's alcohol and eating the farmer's food. And by the end of the book, it says that you couldn't even tell the difference between a farmer, a human, and a pig who had started to walk on his hind legs. And as the book goes on, to protect this consolidation of power that they're so hungry for and greedy for, they start changing those seven commandments that everyone had agreed to just subtly. And at the very end of the book, the seventh commandment is revealed. And it no longer says all animals are equal. It says all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Utopia doesn't work. Anarchy doesn't work. The problem is that you're trying to combine a holy vision with unholy people. The problem is that we are created to be worshipers. We have this vision of a kingdom, but we want it without a king. We were created to be worshipers. We're going to open up um, Romans 1, 19. Paul says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. He sh them being people, that's us. What can be known about God is evident because he showed it to us. For his invisible attributes, the things we can't see, namely his, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So God created the world. That's the things that have been made. And he spent six days crafting this thing that he said was very good. And he, he created animals and plants and mountains and oceans and beauty and sunsets and sunrises and all of these things. He said, they're beautiful. They're very good. And then he took humans and he dropped us in it. He said, you should be able to see me in this. He dropped us in it and he said, look at who I am. I'm eternally powerful. I'm divine. And I love you. I created this for you. And so as he created us with his image in us, we're created as people who need to worship. We have a desire to worship. We give our hearts to all kinds of things. And if it's not God, if it's not the gospel, if it's not Jesus, we end up giving our hearts to other things to worship. And so what happens is we want a kingdom. We want glory. We want magnificence. We want, we want to see power displayed in our world, but we want the kingdom without the king. And it leaves a void in us. When we have no more king to worship, it leaves a void. And we start filling that void with all kinds of things. But let me summarize it. The only thing we can fill that void with is the kingdom of me. In this world, there are only two kingdoms that man can serve. Man can serve the kingdom of God, or, as he was created to do in the Garden of Eden, like I just said, or he can serve the kingdom of me. And each one of us have to fight with this tension in our lives because we are creatures who want to worship. In Luke, um, in Luke 16, Verse 13, uh, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. He's talking here about money, but it, it applies in other ways. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or through his actions, because you can't, you can't please two people, right? His actions will show that he loves the one and despises the other. 
He says you can't serve both God and money, but you can fill in the blank there with whatever you want. We have a kingdom of me that we try to build. And so what does that look like? We have this kingdom of God, and we know what that looks like, I think. I think we kind of have an idea what that looks like. It's, he's the rightful king of the universe that he's created. He has created the kingdom. He is the source of glory and magnificence and power and great displays that are spectacular. And he's the rightful king that deserves the credit for those. And then there's the kingdom of me. And the kingdom of me is what I do whenever I want to be elevated. There's a void in my life, and so what I do is I try to put myself in that void. In real life terms, here's what that means. It means utopias never work because when someone offends me, they're, def they're offending the very honor of my kingdom. And my kingdom's honor has to be defended, and that's when wars break out. We serve the kingdom of me. And when we have these two kingdoms, they cannot coexist. We cannot serve two masters. The kingdom of me will breed insecurity in your life. Serving the kingdom of me will breed insecurity because I'm always looking to what other people think. I'm always looking to shifting opinions. I'm always trying to read people and not say the wrong thing or not do the right thing. It's, it's endless. And I'm always going to be insecure. I'm going to be insecure in who I am. I'm going to be insecure in what I do. I'm going to be insecure in how much I earn or how I speak or whether I smoke or whether I drink. I'm never going to be satisfied because I'm always going to be worried about what the next person thinks. And when two people don't think the same thing, then I have to please both of them. It never ends. The kingdom of me brings insecurity. The kingdom of God brings us security. We know that we are children of God. We're loved by him. He died for us. And when we serve the kingdom of God, then we have security in who we are. The kingdom of me brings immorality. A whole slew of immoral choices that can be made in secret because no one will ever know, because it shows that I have power over my own life, because it'll give me a leg up over my neighbor or over my coworker. And we make bad choices, and immorality is bred in places where we're serving the kingdom of me, but the kingdom of God brings integrity. We've got a God who loves us and has given generously to us, and so then we are, out of gratitude, we can serve him, and we know that we will have everything we ever need, and then we can have integrity. And so the kingdom of me brings immorality. The kingdom of God brings integrity. The kingdom of me brings identity crises. We put our identity in other things to build up our kingdom, to build up our influence, and make people think better of us. My job, my career, my marriage, my kids, my, my championships. I don't know what it is for you. My ability to be liked is a big one for me. And we put, our, we put our faith in those things, but what happens? We put our identity in those things, but what happens when I'm not liked? What happens when my kids go down the wrong path and I get a call from the police? What happens, when, what happens when my marriage goes down the tubes because this immorality we just talked about comes out? What happens when I get passed over for a job promotion at work? My identity is shaken. Serving the kingdom of God gives us a true identity, who we were created to be by the creator that made us. And we can rest in that. And all the things swirling around us don't affect us the same way. And Jesus talked about this even more. He talked about the instability of serving the kingdom of me. And he talked about it in terms of building a house. And he said, the foolish man will build the house on the, on the sand. And that's what, that's what this is. is. It's building a house on a situation where where everything is shifting. The ground underneath of you is always moving. You always have to be holding things up. I'm thinking of these cartoons right now where, you know, like something starts to fall and they catch it and then something starts to fall over here and they stick a leg out and then something falls over here. And it's always a balancing act because everything's always moving. 
The wise man, though, built his house on the rock. And the rock doesn't get shaken. And the rock doesn't fall. And the storms are going to come, for sure, but they're not going to destroy me because I'm inside a castle built on a rock. And it's not going to get destroyed. We have to ask this question. Am I going to build my kingdom? Am I going to build the kingdom of me, or am I going to build God's kingdom? We desire in our lives to see glory. We want to see a great kingdom, but when we imagine that, who is the king on the throne? I want to read from, uh, I want to learn together from Galatians today. One second. Galatians is a great book um, that I've not spent a lot of time in before um, the last few months. <coughs> and Paul is, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis, but Paul's going to talk a lot about law and grace. And when he talks about law, what he's talking about is trying to appear good enough. He's talking about building the kingdom of me. And we need to establish this. All this stuff that we just talked about is so important to the book of Galatians. So in Galatians, Paul, who was building his own kingdom really well, he was a young guy, he was a wunderkind, he was, he was building his kingdom in the kingdom of Judaism. He was on the rise, he was smart, he was, he was driven, he was pursuing Christians because they were poisoning the faith of Jewish people in the ancient world, and he was, on the, he was on the fast track to success, baby, until God came to him, and Jesus blinded him and humbled him and said, you're going to serve my kingdom. So Paul sets out, and he, says, he gives his entire life to planting churches and to, to taking the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, to the entire ancient world at that time, mostly to Gentiles who were outside of the Christian faith, even though he came from inside the inner circles of the Jewish faith. Paul had built his kingdom. And so he, as, he, as he moved around, he, he planted these churches, and then he stayed in touch with them. He would, have, he would have some of his colleagues and friends go to these places and take a message from him, and they'd come back and report what the church is up to. And then he'd send them out again, and they'd come back, and they'd report to him. And he would do these back-and-forth correspondences with people. And at one point, someone must have come to him and say, Hey, things are messed up in Galatia. Remember all that stuff about grace? Yeah, they're not teaching that anymore. And so Paul writes this letter to the Galatian church. We call it a book, but it's the letter from the pastor that planted the church who wants these people to understand the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ. And he says, basically, you guys are putting stumbling blocks in people's way. He says, you're... You're too worried about the rules. You're too worried about what people are doing. And you're making it too hard for them to come to know Jesus. You're saying they have to get everything right. What you're saying is this. You've got your kingdom built, and you want other people to prove their kingdom is good enough to latch on to yours. You're no longer serving the kingdom of God. And in fact, he says it this way in Galatians 1.10. He says, am I still Am I still seeking the approval of man, or am I seeking the approval of God? If I'm seeking the approval of man, then I am no longer a servant of Christ. If I'm still seeking to build my kingdom, then I am no longer a servant of God's kingdom. I can't serve two masters. And when my, my actions betray me, if I am found to be seeking the approval of mankind, there's no way that I'm also pleasing God. And so then in chapter 2, he talks about this, this, um, this interaction he has with the, the leaders of the time, with Peter and James and John and all the other members of the Beatles. And, and he, I mean, all right, so, and he comes, he comes to this place where he's, he's talking to them, 
And he's seeking their approval because he came and, and he had been persecuting Christians and wanted them to know that, like, you know, we're cool, bruh. And, and, and he, he sets this out, and he realizes these guys are two-faced. Depending on who they're around, they don't, they don't act the same way. And he calls them out on it. He says, you guys are building your own kingdom. You're trying to be liked. You're trying to gain respect. You want people to think well of you, and you're no longer preaching the gospel. You guys are a big part of this issue. And this didn't happen in Galatia, but he's telling this to the Galatians to show them that the things that we put in the way of people coming to know Jesus are foolish. And so we're going to jump in. We're going to spend most of our time here in Galatians today, but I wanted to lay that groundwork. And here's what he says in Galatians, um, in Galatians 2, we're going to start in verse 15. He says, we ourselves, speaking to Peter and John and James and Paul and Ringo, he says, he says, we are Jews. We're Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. And what he means by that is he says, we were, the, we're like the people of God. Like, we're, we're in already. We're good. We're Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Remember what I said works of the law is? It's serving the kingdom of me. We're not justified by works of the law, but we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in, G in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, by serving the kingdom of me, no one will be justified. We want to be justified, is what Paul is saying. We want to be sure that we're being justified by the humility it takes to bow before another and name someone else your king. And he goes on in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, because, you know, we're, we're going to be, is Christ then a servant of sin? Is Christ serving sinners? Well, he did a lot, but, but Paul says here, certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. What he's talking about here is Jesus tore down this old way, the, Jew, the, the Jewish system of Israel's law that God gave to Moses, and they tried to, to live everything perfectly to it. And they, they lived in these kind of concentric circles where God's in the middle, and every time you sin, you kind of move out a ring, and every time you cleanse yourself, you move in a ring. And, and they lived their entire life trying to stay as close as possible. And it's this law system, and Jesus tore that down. And what Paul is saying here is, guess what? You're doing the same thing. You replace the Jewish law with Christian law. And in verse 21, he continues. He says, I don't nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If we could be justified by doing all this stuff, if we could be justified by building our kingdom great enough, then Christ died for no purpose. That should hit heavy. And so it's easy, as I was reading this, I thought, man, it's, it's so easy for, for Christians to see this as like an us versus them thing. It's so easy for us to say, like, we, we are Christians now, right? We are in the church, and so we judge, right? We always talk about, like, culture, right? Culture's outside, and church is inside. There's, there's this us versus them, and we think about the world, and, and, and we, it's so easy for us to say that the world worships their, their, their liberal agenda. I don't know. The, the world worships their sexuality. The world worships this. The world worships money or, or um, a consumerism. And we, it's so easy to say these things and talk about the world. 
until we take a step back and realize, who did Paul write this letter to? The church in Galatia. He wrote this to Christians. And what he's saying is that we do this all the time. We make all these, these, these barriers where people have to accept this or have to agree with this or have to be here or have to be here in order for them to come to Jesus. That's the first step. And then once that's a accomplished, then you can come to Jesus. And we build the system of law back up. And we make people worry about their kingdom before they can come to Jesus. Um, one of the things that's been difficult for us, and I've not run this by my wife. I hope she's okay with it. Um, love you. One of the things that's been hard for us is that, like I said earlier, I, I want to be liked. Um, it's been really hard for me because we moved there as missionaries, and all of a sudden I felt this immense pressure to be a role model. And I wanted to be a perfect pastor and a perfect, you know, hard work ethic, um, perfect husband, perfect father, perfect whatever role I was playing. I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be the example for people. I wanted to be the role model. And what that did is it led me when I had imperfections in those places, it led me to hide those imperfections and put up a front, and it actually made me a worse husband, and a worse father, and a worse pastor, and a, a lazier worker for, for the projects that we were working on. One of the difficulties for me was that even in all of my church work, I was building the kingdom of me. I was asking God. I was not saying, God, I'm going to come build your kingdom. I was saying, God, come into my kingdom. I'm inviting you in. Help me build my kingdom. Help me build my reputation. Help people think well of me. And I was using my faith as a means to get what I valued in my kingdom. And when things didn't go well, I didn't take it as, huh, I should probably work on that. I took it as a personal attack on my kingdom. And I had to circle the wagons. And I had to fight. And I hold myself up behind the castle walls and let nobody in. And when we build the kingdom of me, that's exactly what happens. It's so sneaky. It's so easy to miss. We don't see it. We're sitting in church week after week. We're giving in our offerings. We're, we're volunteering left and right, and we're at the church seven days a week. And somehow, the storm still comes, and God reminds us, you've been building your kingdom on sand. Your heart's not in it. Paul goes on, chapter 3. We're going to cover like two whole chapters of the Bible in, in one sermon, guys. Paul goes on in chapter 3. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. Fun side note. Paul always like starts with these big flowery introductions. He's like, oh, I always thank God in my prayers for you, and you are so wonderful, and I think you're such an encouragement to me. And in the book of Galatians, he's like, Galatians, you fools. Who bewitched you? He jumps right in in the first chapter. Uh, if you've never read it, it's, it's, it's a good read. Um, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, we preached to you that Jesus was crucified. Let me ask you just this. Did you receive the Spirit through works of the law or through hearing in faith? And I would ask you guys the same thing. Every one of you here that's a Christian— Maybe you're not, and that's okay. I'll talk to you in a second. You can check out or check scores or whatever. Here's the question. Did you receive the Spirit? You can go on to the next slide. How did you come to Christ? Did you receive the Spirit by doing enough? Or did you receive the Spirit by humbling yourself before Jesus and realizing that you never could? Every single one of us that's ever come to Jesus, even if you were raised in the church, we all have a moment where we realize he, is, he needs to be my king because I can't, I can't serve my own kingdom any longer. 
None of us have built up enough that we say, you know what? Look at everything I've accomplished. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, God, I'm ready for my place in heaven. Like, that doesn't happen. That's not how it works. Every one of us has humbled ourselves, and we've fallen down before Jesus, and we've said, I need your grace. And so what he says, I think this is the next slide. It's the next verse. So let's, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit of works by law or hearing by faith? He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you, did you bow before Jesus? and say, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior. I want new life. Did you get baptized in faith and then come up out of the water and immediately start trying to earn your salvation or prove to God that you are worth his investment? We immediately change our posture from one to bowing to one to standing and expecting God to bow before us and serve us. And so he says uh, in verses 5 and 6, does he who supplies the Spirit to you, right, because all believers have the Holy Spirit, did he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing by faith? We all know the answer to that question. We don't come to God in pride and humility. He's the king. And when we're honest with ourselves, we know that we are not. Paul goes on. And he goes on again. There we go. This verse, um, this verse wrecked me, just so you know, when I came to it. I'd been to seminary, and I clearly it wasn't worth it because, like, I missed this, what I'm about to share with you guys, for years. He says, for those who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Those who live trying to build their own kingdom are under a curse. For it's written, curse is everyone who does not abide by everything written in the book of the law and do them. And here's, this is what's so interesting to me. This is what I missed. There are two curses in this verse, and they're different. The first one is the ticket that you pay. It's the price that you pay for the sin that you've accomplished. There are lawbreakers and law keepers, and it's clear in the Bible there are no law keepers, so we're all lawbreakers, and we become lawbreakers as soon as we break the law. There's a penalty to pay for what we've done wrong. That's the first curse, or that's the second curse, actually. But up at the beginning, it says all who what? All who rely on that. And this is what I was doing in my family and in my, in my ministry, is, is I, was, I was relying on my ability to keep the law. And then I didn't. I made mistakes. I messed up. And I, I, and I slayed myself because of it. And I hid all that. Those who break the law, those who do bad things and, and, and do things that are against God's will, we've, we've all done it, and we are guilty and there's guilt there. But the first curse here is all who rely. It's the shame that comes with the fact that I'm relying on this and I've failed. It's the foundation of my kingdom. It's the sand that it's built on and I've failed. And the storms are going to come and they're going to wash those foundations away. And he took the penalty. This is um, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, curses everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might, be, it might come to the Gentiles and we might receive the promised spirit through faith. For, through, through faith. Paul, t uh, Jesus takes away our curse. And not just the curse of guilt. He took that away when he died on the cross. But by breaking the power of shame and sin that it has over us, 
He removes the shame that makes the second curse. He removes our need to, sh- to, to build that up on ourselves, to, to rely on the law. There's an old, an, an old Christian hymn, The Rock of Ages. And the last line of the first verse says, Be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. We need to be saved, not just from sin's guilt. Yes, we've been saved from sin's guilt. That's what we celebrate every Sunday. But we need to be saved from sin's power. And so in in, uh, Galatians 3.19, he talks about Abraham for a little while. Go read it. You know, it's a page turner. Um, Go read that. But in verse 19, he says, Why then the law? Like, if it can't save us, why did we have it? It's kind of pointless. If you know what I'm saying, Galatia. Why then the law? If it's so worthless. And he goes on. It was added because of transgression. So Abraham came. It does talk about Abraham. Abraham came before the law. Abraham's before Moses. Okay, that's all you need to know here. You can go read the story. But Abraham came before Moses, and believing through faith came before the law. He says the law was added because of transgressions, because of sins, until, until its offspring should come to, uh, to whom the promise had been made. We don't sin because there's a law that says something's wrong. Our current culture, like the cultural moment that we're in, tries to say that we can remove sin if we just stop saying stuff is wrong. Stop, stop with the law and we won't have sin anymore. And what this says is the law came as a response to our sin. We were sinners to begin with. Remember, God dropped us in the Garden of Eden, and he said, look at who I am. I love you. And we turned our backs on that offer. We were already sinners. And so then the law came as a precursor to Jesus to show us that we needed grace, to show us that we weren't perfect, to show us how we failed. And in verse 21, Paul says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Is God changing his mind? Is he flip-flopping and waffling? Can we trust God? He says, of course we can. Of course it's not contrary. If a law had been given, this is a big if, if a law had been given that could save us, then we would have to follow it. If God had given us a law that could save us, then we would have been obligated to follow it in order to earn our salvation. The implication there is that it can't. It can't save us. It was never meant to. God gave us an impossible law to uphold, an impossible law to keep all the rules so that we would see that we can't. Sin came first, and law came as a mirror so that we would be faced to, we would be forced to see who we really are. And the law comes so that we have to look in the mirror. In verse 22, so in verse 20, uh, 21, he said, For the law has been given that could give. Um, life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. That was the first time I'd read that too. I don't know what they taught me in seminary. It was, but but this is the first time I've heard the scripture imprisoned us under sin. We're supposed to be holding the book up. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be talking about how truth is in this book. And what Jesus says is scripture is, has imprisoned the world to sin so that the promise given through Christ might be given to those who believe. We had to see this law. There had to be this period where we were forced to look in the mirror. There had to be this period where we, where we recognize our sinfulness. And 
And so God created us in Eden, and then we turned away, and the whole rest of the Bible is God trying to show his reconciliation to us, and us turning away, and us turning away, so he finally gives the law to Moses, and we turn away, and we turn away, and we realize after hundreds and hundreds of years, a couple thousand years, that we're, we're wrecked. Romans 3.20 says that through the law comes knowledge of sin. And what we do is we take that thing that was never meant to save us and we keep building it up as the way that people need to be saved, the way that people need to come to Jesus. A couple verses later, you might know this one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you know how many times I've used that as a thing to, like, to beat down people who I think are sinners? To show them that they're sinners? Do you notice that there's a comma at the end of that? I didn't. There's not a period there. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We are redeemed in our sinfulness by redemption in Jesus. Meanwhile, back in Galatia, Paul says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. We just talked about that. Like, this isn't a bad thing. It was meant God gave it to us so that we would see it. We were captured under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. And the word there could mean warden. The law was our warden. It was put on the gate so that we would see that we can't get out of it until Christ came. in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under a warden. Do you know, um, there's a word for it. Do you know what it's called when a warden is guarding a prison and then the warden is no longer guarding the prison? I think I just heard it. Freedom! We have freedom. We were under the curse of the law. We were under the curse of building up our own kingdoms. This was the cycle of the entire world up until Jesus came, is building up our own kingdom and getting it washed down, and building up our own kingdom and getting it washed down and washed away. And then Jesus came, and he gave us freedom. But now that faith has come, you're no longer under a guardian. You're free. For in Christ Jesus, you are all, this is verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith. God doesn't call us out of our kingdoms to make us peasants. He doesn't call us out of our kingdoms to make us servants. He doesn't even call us out of our kingdoms to make us nobles. He calls us out of our kingdom to make us princes and princesses and his sons and daughters, the sons and daughters of the high king who created the entire kingdom, the only one worthy of being praised, and he calls us his children. We leave our kingdoms on the sand, our sand castles. We join God's royal court. It says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew, there's not Greek, there's not slave or free or male or female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. You're all his children. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, and you are heirs to the throne according to the promise. So the question is, what do we do with this? Um, if you are like me, I might be the only one that does this, but um, if you're like me, normally by Monday afternoon, I've forgotten what the sermon was on Sunday, if it lasts that long. 
we're in this, we're in this pattern as, as just as modern people. We've got so much stuff like whizzing around our ears all the time. The question is, what do I do with it? It can't just be an intellectual thing. So I want to give you something practical. And this is, this is just something you can do over and over throughout your week, throughout your day. Ask this question, who wears my crown? Where am I giving my crown power over my life? Am I putting my crown on myself and my own image and my own kingdom? Or am I putting my crown on, am I thro- casting my crown before the king and creator? And this, is, this has practical means. When, when, the, when the fight starts with, with your spouse, who are you going to let wear your crown? When you're on the internet and the dark corners of the internet are beckoning you, who wears your crown in that moment? Who do you give your heart to? When you're on the internet um, in, well, some might consider equally dark places like Facebook, and, and people post stuff that's just idiotic, and you can't believe it, and I'm not going to say which side of the aisle that's on. When people put their faith in things that are not Jesus, who wears your crown then? When people say things that anger you, who wears your crown then? When you get passed up for a job at work, do you hold a grudge? Or do you respond in grace? and support for the person that that got the promotion. Who wears your crown each and every moment of each and every day because it's so sneaky the way we slip back over into our old kingdom. Got a couple other um, practical things. They're not rocket science. The first one is this, prayer. We need to be people that pray. What prayer is, is when you lay your heart before the king. Prayer is you laying your heart out. And if you're actively praying and saying these things to God that you're struggling with and worried about and all these things, there's no way that you can do that day after day after day after day and still hold on to them. The practice of regular prayer is where we lay our hearts out before God. If you've never tried it before, I would highly recommend praying on your knees, bowing before God, literally, in a physical sense. It's hard to feel powerful when you're on your knees with your face on the ground. We need to be people that pray. We need to be people that expose our hearts to Jesus. The second thing is we need to be people who read Scripture. That's the opposite. That's when God's heart is laid before us. And we lay out his heart before us and what he's revealed to us about himself. And again, you can't be faced with the same truths day after day after day after day after day after day and be stuck in the same sins forever. It just doesn't work. The king wants you in his kingdom. He wants to take those things off your heart and he wants to show you what his kingdom is like. And so we need to read scripture so that we're not just building a picture of God that looks a whole lot like ourselves. And the third thing is this, we need accountability. And Josh didn't know I was going to do this, but it, it fits. This is what home groups are good for. This is where you take something out of the, the mental space Right on Sunday mornings, we come and we have knowledge and we learn and we read scripture. We do, and it's, it's great. But if you do nothing with that knowledge, it becomes toxic to you. Did you know that? If all you do is build up knowledge and you don't do anything with it, you don't apply it, it becomes toxic. All discipleship is, is knowledge of God applied. And we need accountability. We need people in our, in our lives to ask us, did you give more attention to your spouse than your phone this week? We need people to say to us once in a while, you know, the way that you're spending doesn't show that your heart is where you say it is. Or it seems like your priorities are out of order. We need people that are going to ask us difficult questions like, have you treated, have you been on the internet with integrity this week? 
Have you wished for someone to fail so that you could succeed? We need people in our lives that will ask us these questions. And most of the time on Sunday mornings, we just don't get that. And so we need to be involved with other Christians. If we don't do anything with the knowledge, it just becomes another brick in the sandcastle of the kingdom of me. And we build it up and we build it up and we build it up and it still gets washed down and we build it up and we build it up and we build it up. The difference, the way that we take that out of there and apply it to God's kingdom is we are with other believers and we let them change us. First John talks about God being a God of light and hating darkness, and hating shadows, and hating secrets. And we need to be people that expose things and experience the freedom that says, you know what? I'm not under the law. I don't have to build my own kingdom. I don't have to be perfect. There's no warden anymore. I can walk out. It's the only way that we keep our hearts from slipping out of God's kingdom and, and trying to build up our own, our own again. And so my question for you this week is who wears your crown? Let me pray for us.